Thank you, worship team. We appreciate that very much. Man, if you have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to take them out and open them up to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Man. Well, we'll go ahead and uh, address the pink elephant in the room. Uh, it is true that um, my, my nephew passed away Saturday uh, morning. This is the third child of, of my sister, my brother-in-law, that came here for a while. They lost their, their child two years ago, 21-year-old. And uh, now they lost their third out of four children. He was 29. And uh, we found out that he, he passed away Saturday morning. Uh, so I've been with the family all day yesterday. As you, uh, as you can imagine, I'm sure at some point we'll have a funeral this week. Uh, we will do that down in Louisiana. My my brother-in-law has a uh, a family cemetery down there, uh, and so at some point I'm sure we'll be going down down to Louisiana and and doing the funeral. So thank you so very much for for praying for us and our family. We can definitely feel the love and and the support. And just in case you're wondering, my board was very gracious to me when I called them uh, Saturday morning and let them know what was going on. And all of them said, "Hey, it's okay if you don't come Sunday. It's okay if you don't preach." And but you know, I want to be here. I want to be here because this is my family. I mean, that's my family, but this is my family. And and I get support off of you. So um, thank you for listening. I may stumble through it today, but just say amen and add a boy, even though I struck out swinging. You know what I'm saying? And uh, we'll, <laughs> we'll, we'll get through it. All right, if you have your, your Bibles, uh, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Today we, we are going to observe communion and I thought we would take a moment and just kind of look at communion and prepare our hearts to receive communion. Now, if you happen to be a guest here, you do not have to be a member of this local church to take communion. Um, we just believe that you need to be a part of the church. In other words, repent of your sins and have asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life. And if you are born again, then you are a part of the church. And if you are here this morning and you are saved, then we want you to partake of communion with us. But having said that, let's look in our scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 26 through 32. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. Father, we ask that you would bind every distraction, every hindrance, O oh Lord, that would keep us from receiving this word this morning. We pray, God, that we would have ears to hear. And Lord, I pray that if there's any here this morning that's not in a right relationship with you, that this message would be used, oh God, your spirit would draw them unto yourself. That today is not a day of judgment, but today is a day of mercy and of forgiveness. And I ask, oh God, that they would indeed repent of their sins, come back into a right relationship with you. I thank you for that. It's in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen, amen. Now, from this passage of Scripture, there are uh, three directions that we should look while observing communion. Three directions that we need to look at as we observe communion. Number one, we need to look backward. Look backward. The Scripture reads in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 26, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. And so the first direction we need to look is back. Because originally, whenever the church, the early church, observed communion, it was a part of a fellowship meal. So the church had a meeting location and they would come 
and they would have a meal together, and at some point during the meal, they would observe communion. Now, communion was originally called the Passover. It became known as the Lord's Supper or the Lord's Table because, again, the idea was centered around a meal. Eventually, it became known as communion. Now, the background to communion is found in the book of Exodus. In the early, early chapters of the book of Exodus, Israel, the nation, is in slavery. They're in bondage to the Egyptians. Well, the Lord raised up Moses and Aaron to be the deliverer of Israel. And he would send, God would send Moses and Aaron into Pharaoh's palace. And they would say, Pharaoh, let my people go. And Pharaoh would say, no. And then the Lord would send a plague upon Egypt. And this happened nine times. And then came the tenth and final plague. And the Lord prepared Moses and the nation of Israel for this tenth and final plague. In Exodus chapter 12, the Lord called Moses to himself. And he said, Moses, I want you to prepare for the tenth and final plague. You're going to go into Pharaoh's palace and you're going to ask Pharaoh one more time. Pharaoh, let my people go. Pharaoh's going to say no. And then I'm going to send the last plague upon Egypt. Now, in order to be prepared for this, here's what you need to do. Call the nation together. Tell them that every family must be represented by a lamb. If a family is too small to have its own lamb, tell them they can join with another family. But every family needs to be represented by a lamb. Now, this is not just any lamb. The lamb had to meet certain requirements. Uh, the scripture tells us that it had to be male. It had to be young. It had to be perfect without blemish. It had to be scrutinized for four days. If it was found perfect, they were to kill the lamb at twilight. And they were to make sure as they killed this lamb not to break any bone of its body. And then once that lamb was killed, they were to take a hyssop, which is basically a branch of a tree, and they were to dip it in the blood, and they were to smear blood on the sides of the doors and then across the top. The Lord said, take the lamb that you killed, roast it in fire with bitter herbs, make unleavened bread, and eat it. And whenever you eat it, eat it fully dressed. You should have a, your, your, your robe on, it's, you know, belt around your waist, sandals on your feet, staff in your hand. Because the night that you kill that lamb, I'm going to pass through the land of Egypt. And as I pass through the land of Egypt, I'm going to kill every firstborn man and animal that does not have that blood applied to the doorposts of their home. And so that's exactly what Moses did. He called the nation together. He told them what to do. And that night, Israel, all of those families, killed those lambs. And they took the blood and they applied it to the doorposts of their homes. And that night, the Lord went through Egypt. And as he went through Egypt, he struck every firstborn man and animal dead that did not have the blood applied to the doorposts of their homes. But when he saw the blood, he passed over them in judgment. And that's why it's called Passover, because when he saw the blood, he would pass over that home and go to the next that did not, and he struck. Can you imagine the cry that went up in the middle of the night when mamas went into their nurseries and found that the firstborn had been dead? Can you imagine the cry of wives as they looked over and realized their husband is dead because he was the firstborn of a family? Can you imagine the cries that went up in the land of Egypt? And when that happened, Pharaoh called Moses into his chambers, and he said, Moses, take your people and leave immediately. And that's why the Lord told Moses to make sure that the nation was fully dressed, because the moment that Pharaoh let them go, they had to go. And whenever they left, Egypt was so glad to see them leave, they were handing them all kind of riches, saying, will you please go? And the Lord delivered Israel by the blood of the Lamb. Along comes Jesus in the New Testament. Jesus is identified as the Lamb of God. He is identified as the Passover Lamb. When John the Baptist was baptizing people in the Jordan River, and he saw Jesus come and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We're told in the book of Revelation that Jesus is the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world. 
Paul tells us in Corinthians that Jesus, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the Passover Lamb. He met every single one of those requirements. Let's look at them real quickly. You remember? There were several things that the Passover Lamb had to meet. The Passover Lamb had to be without blemish. Had to be without blemish. And we know that Jesus was without blemish. He was born of a virgin. This is why in Genesis, in Genesis 3.15, it was the seed of the woman. Because the seed of a man was not involved in Jesus being born. Mary was a virgin. She had never known a man until after Jesus was born. He was born of a virgin. Therefore, he did not contain a sin nature like you and I. Every person who was born of a man and a woman has a sin nature. You are going to sin. And if you don't believe me, keep the nursery. Hang around children. Little devils. I mean, you're angels, sweet angels. Sweet angels. We all have a sin nature. We're going to sin. Listen to this. But not Adam. Because God created Adam out of the dust of the earth, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. Adam did not contain a sin nature, but he had the capacity to sin, and he did. This is how we know we have free will. Come on, Calvinist. Jesus, born of a virgin, did not have a sin nature, but he had the capacity to sin. But he did not. Jesus never committed one sin. Yet he who knew no sin became sin that you and I might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. He willingly took the sin upon himself, meaning our guilt. The deepest, darkest thing you have ever done that you've never shared with another human being in that moment. That's when God loved you. And that's when Jesus went to the cross for you because that's how much he loved you. He took your sin and guilt and shame and put it upon himself so that he could pay the penalty of death so that when God gets ready to judge, he can pass over you because you have the blood of the lamb applied to your heart. He was without blemish. Number two, Jesus was a male. I don't think I know you going in detail. Number three, he was young. Jesus was 33 and a half when he died. Number four, he was scrutinized. Do you remember the Passover lamb? They had to, they had to set it apart and they watched it for four days to make sure that it was perfect. Jesus Christ was scrutinized everywhere that he went, especially the week of the Passover in which he was to be crucified. They were out to get him. They watched him. They set traps for him, didn't they? They would ask him questions, trying to catch him, saying something against Rome or what have you, or the law, or the Old Testament, or the Pharisees. He was scrutinized. Number five, he was killed publicly. You remember the the Passover lamb in the book of Exodus had to be killed publicly and at twilight. That's an interesting word. It means between two evenings. Because in the Hebrew, between two evenings. And the reason for that is this. The Hebrews count time differently than us Romans, Western world. Go by the Roman time and Roman calendar. The Hebrews count it from day, I'm sorry, from sundown until sundown. And so twilight means between two evenings, as it was dusk, as it was becoming night, the Romans counted it one way, the Hebrews counted another, so it looks like it's between two evenings. Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary at 3 p.m. He was nailed to the cross at 9 in the morning and died at 3. The reason for that is because that was the times that the sacrifices were being made. And Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Nailed to the tree at 9 and died at 3. When he died, there was darkness over the face of the earth from 12 until 3. And then when he died, all of a sudden, it came shining through. Why? Because he died between two evenings. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the world. He had to be the Passover Lamb. He was killed publicly. He wasn't off in some secret room somewhere. He wasn't off in some some room in the back of a building or the temple. 
He died publicly. They stripped our Lord naked, and they whipped him, and they tortured him, and they hit him, and they humiliated him, and they put the cross beam on his shoulders, and they made him carry his own instrument of death through the city to the place of Golgotha, the skull, Calvary, the place where he would be crucified. And there he was raised up, suspended like a dying animal between heaven and earth, and he did it for you, and he did it for me, and he did it publicly so that people could see. And we need to be the same way whenever we accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. The reason why we have people come forward is because we need to show publicly that we have accepted Christ. He didn't die for you secretly, and you don't serve him secretly. Not a bone in his body was broken. Now, to me, this is fascinating. Think about all the times he was hit in the face. I mean, you know the trials, right? There were at least six trials he went through. Some of those he was beaten, whipped, nailed, and not a bone in his body was broken. Tell me God can't watch over his word to perform it. Of course, we know as he was in the cross in the middle and somebody on the left and somebody on the right, when it came time to make sure they they were dead, they would take something and break their legs because, see, when you're nailed to the cross, the only way that you could breathe was to force yourself up on, on, on your legs because what really happens, the way to hang you is you suffocate. You can't breathe. Your arms are dislocated. Uh, the, the, the only way to breathe is to force yourself up on your legs. Well, they would come and they would break your legs. So now you can't, you can't pull up enough to breathe, and so you suffocate. Break his legs. Break his legs. When they came to Jesus, they stopped. In order to make sure he was dead, they ran a spear through his side and blood and water came out. Those in the medical field know it's a sign, cardiac arrest. He had already died. Not a bone in his body shall be broken. They took him off the cross. They buried him in the tomb. And there he was for three days. But on the third day, up from the grave he arose, a victorious, conquering king, who has now conquered death, hell, and the grave. And anyone who takes the blood of Jesus Christ and applies them to the doorposts of their hearts, when God gets ready to pass out judgment, or you die and you stand before the judge of all the earth, he will pass over you in judgment. And you have grace, and you have mercy, and you have forgiveness, and you have salvation, and you have healing, and you have deliverance because of the blood of the Lamb that is applied to your heart. So when we, when we take communion, we're looking back and we're thanking God that he sent Jesus to be the penalty of sin, to pay the penalty of sin with his death and his burial. But we're also thanking God that he rose again. Because see, Paul tells us in Corinthians, had Jesus merely died and been buried in the tomb, but if he never came out of that grave, we are still in our sins. But the resurrection of Jesus Christ guarantees that we have hope and forgiveness and salvation. And though a man die, yet shall he live because of his faith in Jesus Christ. And so when we take communion today, we're thanking God for his death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ and we because of him because of the blood that he shed over 2,000 years ago we have salvation and deliverance and we're still saved by the blood of the lamb Jesus Christ so the first direction we look is back the second direction that we look during communion is forward we look forward. Listen to the scripture. 
1 Corinthians 11 and verse 26. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Till he comes. So every time we take communion, we're looking back at the events of the cross of Calvary and what it means to us today. But we're also looking forward. Why? Why are we looking forward to his coming? Because he said he was. Listen to this in John 14, 1 through 3. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Jesus said he was coming again. He's never lied about anything else. He's not lying about this. He is coming again. Revelation 22, 7. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Again in Revelation 22, 12 through 13. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Jesus Christ is coming again. If he could watch over his word, that the hundreds of prophecies about his birth, his life, his miracles, his death, his resurrection have come to pass, then you could take it to the bank, honey. If he said he's coming again, he's coming again. And when he comes, he's not coming alone. Scripture tells us in 1 Corinthians 4, 16 through 17, for the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then those of us which are alive and remain shall be caught up in the clouds to meet with them, with the Lord, and thus we will always be with him, Jesus Christ, is coming again. And when he comes again, he's bringing everyone who has died in Jesus Christ with him. And what a reunion day that will be when Jesus Christ returns. And when he comes again, another reason why we're looking forward to his coming, not only did he say he was, not only is he bringing his loved ones with him, but he's going to take communion with us. Listen to this, Matthew 26, verses 26 through 29. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. <laughs> so we look forward during communion. We look back, thanking God for the benefits of the cross. But we look forward to his coming again because we're going to be reunited with our loved ones, assuming that they were saved. And then when we take communion, we look forward with anticipation, realizing that the next time we take communion, it could be with Jesus. Wow, that's a fascinating thought to me. Lastly, out of the three directions we look during communion, backward, forward, inward. We have to look inward. Go back to our text. It's in. 1 Corinthians 11, pick up in verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this reason, many are weak and sick among you, and many sleep. Now that word sleep. That's really nice Bible language for dead, you know. But how many times have you seen somebody walk up to the casket going, man, they look so peaceful, right? they like they're resting. In reality, for a born-again Christian, we're not dead. It's just like a really good nap. 
one day that body will be raised again and our soul will be reunited with our body. And it's going to be so much better than the one you got right now. Look to your neighbor and say, thank God, I've been praying for you. <laughs> Think about the seriousness of what's being communicated here. Paul, the apostle, right into a church he fathered. Listen to what he's saying. The reason so many are weak and sick and dead among you in your church is because you're taking communion in an unworthy manner. Now look, today, it's not, I'm not, not fear, but seriousness of what we're doing. You know, if we're not careful, we just do things. We just go through motions without really thinking about what we're doing. But when we take communion, Lord's Supper, Lord's Table, Passover. It's a serious matter. And so we need to, need to look inward and, and make sure that we're in the faith. And, listen to this, if we would judge ourselves, verse 31, we would not be judged, but when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. See, we examine ourselves to make sure we're in the faith, and then we also examine ourselves to make sure we're in unity. We'll talk about that in just a moment. And when we find we're lacking, we need to repent. That's part of judging ourselves. Oh, I'm lacking here. I need to repent and make this right. If not, then the Lord will judge us. But he does so so that we're not condemned with the world. See, the Lord may judge us, we may suffer consequences for our actions, but that doesn't mean we're condemned with an unbelieving world. In our New Testament, Easy Grace American Church, we have lost sight of the fact that God is a just and a righteous and a holy God. Yes, he's love. Yes, he's mercy. Yes, he's grace, but he's also righteous, judge, and holy. And just because we commit a sin and we ask for forgiveness does not always mean that the consequences are removed from our actions. Does God forgive you? Absolutely. Um. trying to think of an example that would not be offensive, but since I can't find one, I'm just going to say it. If you eat, come on, bluebell ice cream. Glory to God. If you eat, my dad is about the only exception I could think of to this rule. He could eat, I kid you not, he could probably eat half a gallon of bluebell ice cream every night and not gain one pound. His DNA did not get passed to me. I look at it every night and gain a pound. You know what I'm saying? Other than Dale, if you eat ice cream, a pound of it, a gallon of it every night, you're probably going to have some blood sugar issues, probably going to have some weight issues, probably going to have some heart issues that will cause you not to live the quality of life or the extent of life that you should have. If you smoke a pack, two, a carton, whatever it is, a day, My pastor used to tell me, smoking won't send you to hell. Just make you smell like you've been there. But now, in all seriousness, if, if you, and then the Lord convicts you, right? I mean, not saying, and all of a sudden you quit. You know what? I, I don't want to do that anymore. I quit. 
I'm going to ask for forgiveness. God will forgive you for that. But there's no guarantee that you won't have emphysema or COPD or cancer in the future. Because we do reap what we sow. Now, can God override the system? Can he completely forgive and deliver your body and heal your body? Absolutely. And that's what we call a miracle. You see, God put laws in nature. God put laws in our bodies. And that's why the scripture is true. Reap what we sow. But when God decides to override the system so that we don't reap what we have sown, that's called a miracle. Thus, salvation is the greatest miracle. Because we're born in sin, we're going to commit sin. We are sinners deserving of death, but God overruled the system and provided a penalty for it so that you and I could be saved and delivered by the blood of Jesus Christ, that when we die, that has already been paid for us and we can enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so, Whenever we take communion, we need to look inward. Make sure we're in the faith, number one. Make sure we really are saved. Number two, that we want to make sure we're in unity with the other people. Now, the context of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 is that the Corinthian church would come together to have their fellowship meeting. We call it potluck. And they would have a meeting place, and they would bring their food, and they would bring their drinks, right? And they were supposed to wait on everyone to eat together. That's why Paul says, do you not have your own houses to eat in? In other words, they, they were to come together, and they were to wait for the church to be together, who was going to show up that day. And then they would eat, and then at some point during that meal, either the head of the home, because a lot of times they met in houses, so either the head of the home or the pastor of that church would lead the communion service. Well, the Corinthian church was not in unity when Paul wrote this letter. Listen to this in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It tells us from the very beginning. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 10 through 13. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to be concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that e each of you says, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, meaning Peter, or I'm of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? In other words, they, they, were, they had different factions in the church. And they're like, I, you know, Peter's the man. I like, I like Cephas. He, you know, I like Paul. And I like Apollos. I, and, you know, then you have the super spiritual bunch. I'm of Christ. It was their way of being arrogant, saying they were better than everyone else. And so when they came to church, listen to this. I know this is great. We don't ever do this. But whenever they came to church, they were bringing their meals. And instead of waiting on everyone to be there together so they could eat together, they were getting with their little groups and they were eating and could care less what everybody else was doing. To make matters worse, they were eating and not waiting on the poor to even arrive. They had to work. Or sometimes the poor couldn't even provide food. So when they come into the service, all of a sudden you have these little groups over here and they're eating and they're not even sharing with people who came late or sharing with people who cannot even afford to bring anything. And then to make matters worse, they were getting drunk in church. Not drunk on new wine, a.k.a. Holy Ghost. They were getting drunk on wine. And Paul was saying, this cannot be. You are taking communion in an unworthy manner because it violates the very principles of Christianity. It violates the very principle of servanthood and preferring another person 
that the cross symbolizes. The cross of Christianity isn't about self-service. The cross of Christianity is about serving other people. I mean, think Jesus didn't die for himself. Jesus died for you. And he died for me. And he died for anyone who would repent of their sins. The cross is about serving other people. Thus Jesus said, take up your cross daily and follow me. Now listen to Philippians chapter 2. I'm almost done. Philippians 2, 1 through 8. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, any comfort of love, any fellowship with the Spirit, any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interest of others. Listen to this. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. That's the mind that Christ had, and we're supposed to have that as well. Not only look out for your own interest, but the interest of others. Who being in the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation, taking on the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Service. Preferring other people. Looking out for someone else's interest. And so when the church was coming together in Corinth, when they were coming together and they were breaking off in their little factions and they were eating, you know, us four, no more kind of thing. You know, nobody else is welcome. This is my food. I brought this. This is only for me. Nobody explained to them potluck. Make enough for your family plus one. Come on. So everybody can share. And sit with other people. Talk to the church. Because we all know what happens in a worship service. You people over there. You come in and sit right there. You people right here come in and sit right here. And you people sit here and you people sit there. And if you're not careful, you people don't talk to you people. You people don't talk to you people. I mean, it's just human nature. I'm not, it's not a scolding. It's just human nature. It's what we do. We like. I'm assuming you like the person you're sitting with. Some of you are looking around like, I don't, I don't know. I just sat here. I don't, I don't know. And so the point of having fellowship times, the reason why we do it is twofold. When we have meals together, number one, we're Pentecostal. So we can't do anything else for fun but eat. We'd have a lot more if you'd bring some wine. No, I'm just teasing. I do not drink. Well, I mean, I drink water and coffee. More coffee than water. And then number two, we have those meals so that we could just get to know each other and not be as formal and organized as a church service. Just come in and eat. Sit down with somebody. What's going on in your world? Because we all know we don't have those conversations in the hallway. We do the pleasant treats, don't we? How are you? Okay, how are you? Good. Sure is hot. I'm like, I know it's Memphis. Does that shock anybody? What? You know? Well, it's been raining a lot. And pleasantries. But the point of a church is to share life with each other. That's why I wanted to be here today. That's why Tony and his family are here today. That's why Clint came the Sunday after. Because this is our family. We want to share life with you. Plus, I'd like to try new recipes. And so the point 
principle is still in practice, even though the way we observe communion has changed over time. We, we serve it the way that we're going to serve it this morning. It's not, it's not unbiblical. It's not, it's not wrong. As long as the principles are still practiced. And that is, look back. Thank God for Jesus Christ, who was not a plan B. He is the plan. The Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world. Thank God for that. Look forward. But the next time we partake of communion, it could be with Jesus. He is coming again. And then we look inward. Let's examine ourselves to make sure we're in the faith so, so that we're not judged. We judge ourselves. God, I'm sorry. Forgive me. And then to the best of our ability, we're living in unity with, the, with each other. That's why when we pass out communion, we always say, hold it so we can take it together. This is where it came from. And we'll do it together. And we'll make sure that we're, to the best of our ability, living in, in unity with one another. Now, sometimes you have to bring unity. You know what I mean? Sometimes you have to deal with that. Cast out the scoffer and strife ceases. I mean, you know the scriptures. And the Lord, the Lord will deal with you on that, on how to how to handle, how to bring unity. Maybe it's a family situation. Maybe somebody in the church. The, the Lord, the Lord will give you wisdom. But just to the best of your ability in your heart, you're going to do what's right to live in unity with other believers. Amen. Will our ushers prepare our communion team rather? Will our worship team come back to the platform? Thank God for Ron Reeves, his family. Been preparing communion for years. His dad, Wiley, did it. I believe it was around 30 years where he passed away. And then that mantle was passed on to Ron. I appreciate his service. So everyone's preparing for communion. Just think about these points, these principles rather. Look backward. Think about the cross. Proclaim his death. Number two, look forward until he comes, the scripture reads. It's okay to anticipate. It's okay to long. Because we're dual citizens. United States, kingdom of God. It's okay to want to go home every now and then. Look forward. Look inward. Gentlemen, if you'll come in service, I ask that once they pass out the elements again, if everyone to hold them, we'll, we'll take them together. And if you happen to walk in a little bit late, uh, you do not have to be a member of this church to take communion. We just ask that you have enough integrity to acknowledge whether you're saved or not saved, you're in the kingdom of God or not. If you're born again, you are more than welcome. Take communion with us, your brother and sister in Christ, if that's the case. We serve us. Thank you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sin and shame in love.
Reading from 1 Corinthians 11, and Paul writes in verses 23 and following, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. My fair, we pray over the bread, sir. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Boyd, will you pray over the cup, sir? Let's have a moment of worship before we dismiss today. You can stay seated or you can stand to your feet. Spend some time worshiping before we dismiss. The blood that Jesus shed for me. Oh! 
we we are going to continue to worship. Uh, but I said I would do something, and I, now's the time I, I think we need to do it. We talk about our church being in unity and preferring one another. We do have one out of our church that's going on a mission mission trip. So, Tiffany, if you don't mind, do come stand right here. If I can have some people gather around Tiffany, and let's just pray for her. Lay hands on her. Pray for her. She's going out of the country. I want to make sure that everything goes smoothly. And God's anointing be on you. God's protection be on you. God's provision be for you. We just gather around and pray for her. Amen. Hallelujah. That's good. Amen. Let's say, if you would, church, if you'll just stretch your right hand, just pray for her. And I'll just give the church an opportunity to pray. Just lift up prayers right now before I, before I do so publicly. I want to hear the church pray. Father, we thank you for Tiffany. Lord, we thank you, God, that you've placed this opportunity before her. God, we ask that your spirit go before her. Lord, that you would clear the path. Go ahead and prepare hearts, including hers, to receive, oh God, all that you have planned, all that you had predetermined. We pray that you would be her rear guard. Lord, we ask for divine protection in the name of Jesus, that no evil would come near her. Lord, that she would have the authority of the kingdom to trample over snakes and scorpions. I mean, the demonic entities, Lord, that would come against her to stop this trip. We pray, mighty God, that there would be healing in her hands, the word of God in her mouth. Lord, I pray for her parents so they're letting go of their daughter. I ask, oh God, you give them peace in their hearts. Lord, I pray they'd be tuned with their spirit to know exactly when and how to pray for her. Father, I thank you for the work that you are doing. We give you glory and honor for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen. Hallelujah. Pastor. Pastor is going through a lot to help take care of his family and this family too. Uh, and uh, we need to be praying for him. He told us what he's going through with the loss of his nephew. Um, and he's suffering not just because of the loss of his nephew, but because his family is suffering so much. And if you would help us pray, the deacons to come forward and those that would like to come up and lay hands on him. And to pray for Kelly as she supports uh, Pastor Jason and as pastor is the support for his family. Pray strength and peace into their lives. So if you want to Help us pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We ask you right now to touch Pastor Jason and Sister Kelly. We ask you to give them the strength that they need, the encouragement, Lord, that they would be lifted up so that they can be the strength that they need to be for their family.
I don't want to leave yet because then I got to deal with stuff. Let's just, it'll be, it'll be worse it, just for a moment before we dismiss. Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Amen. Amen. Hey, tomorrow is Memorial Day. And it's a day that we stop and we think and we honor those who have given their lives in the nation, uh, in service of our nation, so we could have freedom that we have. So tomorrow I want to encourage you to make sure that you take time to do that. Tonight at 6 p.m., we're going to take a moment to remember some of those who have given their lives in the service of of our kingdom, spiritual kingdom. So it'll be a little different kind of service tonight, and we'll pull out some names that you may not have heard of and tell you the story, what happened to them. I think it'll be interesting, and it kind of challenges our faith. And also remember those that are suffering around the world right now. Persecution is happening right now. Let's not forget that. Amen. Hope to see you here tonight at 6. God bless you. Thank you for being here. We love you so much, and thank you for your prayers and your support. We really do love you with all of our hearts. God bless you. We'll see you tonight at 6.